Lord God, we want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that you speak and want to be heard by us. And we pray that now we will give you our attention. If you were to visit Jerusalem today and go to the old city and walk around the walls, much of that was constructed or reconstructed by Suleiman the Magnificent, who had conquered the city and rebuilt the walls and the gates in 1541. Pretty neat to be around something that is that old. One of the gates was called the Golden Gate or the Mercy Gate, and it faced the Mount of Olives. On the traditional trail, you would come down the Mount of Olives and then back up from the valley to the city of Jerusalem itself and into the city through this Golden Gate or Mercy Gate. In Suleiman's time, as now, Israel was still waiting on their Messiah. And part of the imagination then, as 1,500 years prior, in the time of Jesus, was that when the Messiah arrived, he would stand upon the Mount of Olives, and he would process into the city from that mountain, down into the valley, and then up and through that mercy gate. Suleiman, the Magnificent, liked things fine, just as they were. He didn't need anybody to come in to deliver people he just got, right? You know, who needs that? And so, in order to make this hope and impossibility. He closed up the gate with stone. So there is no gate there anymore. You can go and you can stand outside and you can see where the archway is in the wall, but all these stones have been built up to hills. And just in case that is not enough, he put a cemetery outside so that the Holy One would have to deal with the defilement of the dead in order to get to the gate, which was already <coughs> closed up. We want to make certain this Messiah would not be welcomed. From our perspective, as believers in Jesus Christ, we would have to tell Suleiman, well, you know, the horse was already out of the Or in this case, maybe not the horse, but the donkey, right? Already out of the barn. A little late on this. Even 1,500 years prior to Suleiman, this was the expectation of the Jewish people for how the Messiah would arrive. Jesus knew that. And by his action, coming into Jerusalem on the donkey, from the Mount of Olives, through the gate, receiving the acclamation of the crowd, those traditional greetings, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, allowing them to turn those and focus them on him. Jesus was making a claim without speaking a word. He was claiming to be Israel's hope, to be the fulfillment of promise and prophecy, to be the dream that Israel longed for. And that kind of statement is a political statement. Suleiman understood that. It would pose a threat to his power, and it posed a threat in Jesus' time. Verse 10 tells us the whole city of Jerusalem was in turmoil. And the word used for turmoil there is the Greek word that is the root of our word for seismic, as in earthquakes. The whole city was in turmoil, because this is a political statement. They call out to Jesus, Hosanna to the Son of David. And in the immediate preceding story, Jesus is twice called Son of David. And that is a, that's a royal claim. David the king, the greatest king in Israel, to call Jesus Son of David is to call him royal, to call him king. It's a political statement. The immediately following story, Jesus goes into the temple and he, he cleanses the temple. He throws out the money changers, the people who are taking advantage of the poor. And we often say, well, he's, he's cleaning out, cleaning house in terms of religion. And yes, he's doing that, but we forget that the temple was also the center for civil government in Jerusalem and in Judea. It's where the Sanhedrin met. And so Jesus is cleaning house in not just the religious way, but in the political way as well. And the very next thing he does in the temple is he invites in the blind and the lame and heals them. And you read back in Leviticus, or you read the David 
stories and you will see that the blind and the lame were excluded from regular roles in Israel's worship. And so Jesus has just made a political statement. The other, one side of politics is the dynamics of power. The other side of politics is the definition of people, who's in and who's out. And he's just included all of these people who were not welcome in worship as the body of the kingdom, his new kingdom. No wonder the whole city was in turmoil. Interesting thing, when it says the city was in turmoil, it's an echo of one of the first stories in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 2. When the wise men from the east come into town, they say, where's the one who's been born king? They use the king language, the royal language. Where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? And King Herod says, I don't have a baby boy, and I'm not interested in the threat to my reign and my power. And so, threatened by a new king, Herod kills the innocent sons of Bethlehem. In this story, threatened by a new kingdom, the Roman and Jewish establishment collaborates to kill the innocent son of David. Because just like Sully, if they could stop this from happening, they would. What about us? When Jesus shows up, he makes some pretty incredible claims. He expects obedience. He expects us to lay down our cloaks and our palms and to even give up our donkeys just because he says the Lord needs it. And personally, I kind of am fond of my donkey. I'd like to keep him for myself. I don't know about you. And so when Jesus shows up, even in our own lives, this is difficult stuff. The dynamics of power, who's going to be Lord over me and my stuff? It's me, please, please. But Jesus said no. In one of those uh, church arguments that churches have no business having, but you know, we do because we're not perfect people. I don't know what it was about. I, I just heard this story, and the, the line at the end of it is the amazing thing to me. I don't know if they were arguing over the color of carpet or, you know, something ridiculous, right? And somebody decides to, like, refer to Jesus in the course of this discussion. And this one person just simply responded, don't bring Jesus into this. <laughs> it's really easy to forget and to get possessive about what's mine, our donkeys, our cloaks, and anything else in our lives. But Jesus will have none of it. Jesus will speak over us and our stuff. The Lord needs it. And we have a choice to make. Are we going to try to put stones in that gate and put a cemetery outside? Are we going to be threatened? Are we going to violent? Are we going to say yes? Dynamics of power. One side of politics that Jesus addresses as he comes into our lives. Another side is the definition of people. Who's going to be acceptable? Who are we going to welcome? Jesus welcomed the blind and the lame. Folks that were not on the list. They didn't get the invitation. But they did with Jesus. So another church story. This happens outside of church settings, but this is a good church story, so I'll tell this one. Chicago, I can't remember how many years ago, it was quite a while back. Um, and I guess by that I mean like maybe it was 30 years ago, maybe it was 40. But Chicago, uh, Wednesday night, it was traditional, like in a lot of places, it was traditional prayer meeting nights and youth group nights. So in this church, they're having a prayer meeting for the adults and youth group down in the basement for the youth. And one of the things they do in the prayer meeting is they pray that God will send more young people. Praise the Lord, right? More young people. God starts to answer their prayers. Their youth group grows. And they had 50 youth. And they got 100 youth. And they got 200 youth. And the prayer meeting took on a different flavor because, you know, they didn't always get everything cleaned up properly, and maybe some ants came into the kitchen because they hadn't gotten everything cleaned up and the trash taken out, and they started praying that maybe Jesus would send the youth somewhere else. <laughs> and God answered their prayer. 
which is a sad thing. They missed out on what became, I'm not sure if it is now or not, but became the largest church in the country. And not that all churches are called to become the largest church in the country. Only one is at a time, right? But they were called to welcome young people. And they got uncomfortable with that. Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom in which all are invited. And we have the opportunity to welcome the all. Capital letters, underscored a couple times, bold, big print. Or we have the opportunity to do with folks in that prayer meeting did and pray that Jesus sent them somewhere else to be welcomed. It is our choice. Jesus comes into the city on a donkey. He presents himself as the whole of Israel. He presents himself as Lord of the Messiah. Here's the amazing thing. He presents himself in humility. In humility. As Lord, he could come like any conqueror would come. He could have walked in like Suleiman. But that's not Jesus. When Matthew quotes the lines from Zechariah, the prophet, he leaves out a line that's right in the middle of that verse. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey. Matthew leaves out that triumphant and victorious because for Matthew, Jesus doesn't come, it's not a triumphal entry. He doesn't come as conqueror. He doesn't come to dominate. He comes to offer himself and give us the opportunity to say yes to this audacious <coughs> call. Lord God, we want to thank you for this gift this invitation of Jesus Christ, this disruption of our lives, our politics, of our power, even over our own self, our futures, our stuff, our families, and this disruption of who's in the circle, this welcome of people that we might not know, might not be comfortable with, but that nevertheless you invite. Lord, we're thankful for this disruption, for this reminder of in Palm Sunday. And yet, Lord, we struggle. We struggle to say yes. <coughs> Give us the courage to be fully yours and to be fully open to all whom you call. In Jesus' name.